Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Okay, Tracy, I think it's fairly safe to say that almost everyone in our age group, probably younger and certainly some older, has seen the famous footage of Galloping Gertie. Yeah, I, even I have a memory of it being used in a commercial for something like car speakers at one point. Either oh. the exact footage or of uh, or like a spoof of the footage, but it was oh. like with the car speaker on, the bridge is shaking itself apart, but with the speaker off, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, we are talking about the first Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which was nicknamed Galloping Gertie. And this footage shows it undulating in waves that, to me, are just completely stomach-churning until it finally breaks apart and collapses. It's very dramatic footage, but here's the thing. The drama of that first Tacoma Narrows Bridge is hardly relegated just to its turbulent end. There is a lot more to that bridge's story, from its inception to financing issues to some surprising legal happenings after it fell apart, and how it spawned this entirely new approach to bridge design. So today we're going to talk about Galloping Gertie, how it came to be, its collapse, and what happened after its failure. Pretty much as soon as people started driving, people started talking about how there needed to be a bridge connecting Tacoma to the Great Peninsula, also known as the Kitsap Peninsula. There were ferry services. There was a train that could take people south around this big U-shape that's created by the waterway. But as more and more people started embracing automobile travel, there was more demand for roadways all over the U.S., including requests for a faster way to make that particular crossing. And as these discussions became more serious, the finances of such a project came into sharp focus. So there was going to need to be a toll to offset the costs, but that was unlikely to generate enough revenue to make up for the expense of construction and to fund ongoing upkeep. Similarly, there was a whole puzzle about which municipality could manage this project. There were provisions in an 1854 law that gave the counties jurisdiction over ferry services to get across waterways, but bridges were not even mentioned in it. There was an operating ferry service that would need to be bought out. Uh, it had exclusivity rights that had been granted in order to cross this narrows, and so they would have to buy out that contract for a bridge or else it would create a whole legal problem for the state in terms of that contract. Still, the allure of this, because it would shorten a two-and-a-half-hour drive down to something closer to 11 minutes, kept interest in this project very steady. And by the end of the 1920s, the Tacoma Chamber of Commerce had assembled a committee to investigate whether such a bridge was realistic and also to raise funds for a survey to make that determination. Much of this effort had been stoked by a man named Edmund Chandler. He had a financial interest in seeing this bridge built because Chandler already ran another toll bridge that connected White Salmon in Washington State to Hood River in Oregon across the Columbia River. So he had experience and expertise to offer the bridge project. Uh, he kind of thought, like, he could become the toll guy and, like, run another toll bridge and potentially have that as a money-making um, endeavor. And so he worked to promote the need for this bridge in Tacoma. Bridge engineers Joseph B. Strauss and John L. Harrington independently completed feasibility surveys as the first step for the Chamber of Commerce's committee. That was finished in 1928. Both the Harrington and Strauss reports were pretty positive, and by early 1929, a license was approved by the state to build a toll bridge. That license was renewed every two years. Yeah, the license renewal kept happening because they weren't in the midst of building it. They were still like, we're planning, we're planning. We need the license to carry forward. <laughs> So they would renew it as they continued to raise funds, because even though the paperwork side was moving things along, uh, it is worth noting that the country was about to hit the Great Depression when this whole thing started. And naturally, that complicated the enterprise, because money for a large-scale project of this nature became harder and harder to come by, as the projected budget needs were also expanding. 
And there were also legal limits on how much money the county could borrow. Those limits, of course, were intended to keep the county from taking on insurmountable debt. But as it related to this particular initiative, it was making the Tacoma Narrows Bridge seem less and less likely to become a reality. Once again, Edmund Chandler offered his services. He worked with Pierce County and the Tacoma Chamber of Commerce to set up the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Company. This was a private corporation, and Chandler owned it. And this setup meant that the limits that would be applied to a government entity borrowing for the construction of a bridge, those limits were no longer a hurdle. The plan was that Chandler's company would borrow the money, build the bridge, and then sell it to the county when it was done. Feels a little shady, which will come up again. (laughs) Uh, The Tacoma Narrows Bridge Company applied for a $3 million loan from the federal government's Reconstruction Finance Corporation. On the one hand, that loan had kind of a favorable view because this one bridge was genuinely valuable. It would connect two national parks and two military bases. So on paper, this project made total sense. But on the other, an assessment by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation determined that the tolls that the bridge would collect were just not going to recoup the loan amount in any kind of worthwhile time frame. The application was temporarily withdrawn for reworking, and in the meantime, the state governor had allocated $700,000 for the project. And the law that had initially not granted counties jurisdiction over bridge building was amended to include that capability. Chandler's company once again submitted the loan application, but this time he went to the newly established Public Works Administration in the hope that some of the funding would be from a grant rather than this entire thing coming as a loan. But this plan did not work. The application was denied, citing the fact that, quote, the funds of the Public Works Administration are now practically depleted. And further, the state of Washington has already shared liberally in these funds. It did not help that the PWA could plainly see that the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Company had been set up to sidestep that law regarding loan sizes. And the whole thing made Chandler seem really, really shady. Additionally, the PWA felt that the numbers in his loan application were way off. It seemed like the estimates for toll revenue were higher than was really realistic, and that the estimated cost of the construction was lower than it should have been. So at this point, it seemed like the bridge was back to square one. When the state minimized Chandler's role and created the Washington Toll Bridge Authority in 1937, it helped this project finally gain traction with the PWA. Incidentally, Chandler later sued the WTBA for monies he believed he was owed for, quote, preparation of estimates, surveys, maps, and other items which he prepared prior to 1936 in connection with the then-proposed construction of a toll bridge across that portion of Puget Sound known as the Tacoma Narrows. That case was dismissed in 1943. In creating the Washington Toll Bridge Authority, the state had been really, really careful and deliberate. Nothing had been rushed, and the WTBA was modeled after other organizations in places that had been able to get PWA funding by meeting all of their very specific requirements, including the California group that had obtained capital for the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. Ultimately, the funding came through as roughly half as a PWA grant and the remaining amount as a loan from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Although this meant that more than $6 million had been secured, the bridge's budget had to be really carefully managed. In the years after the collapse, there was a lot of scrutiny into how that money had been spent and if any of the budget-based decisions had led to the bridge's failure. We're going to come right back and talk about the firm that was hired to design the bridge and some early indications that something was wrong. But first, we will take a quick sponsor break. The New York firm of Leon S. Mosieff designed the superstructure of this bridge. Mosieff had worked on the engineering of the Golden Gate Bridge, as well as just about every other suspension bridge that had been built in the U.S. during the 1920s and 30s. So his firm was kind of the ideal choice for the project. Uh, Depending on how deep down a research rabbit hole you'll go, you'll find people that say that he lobbied for it and was put a little bit of pressure on, on the state of Washington to get this job. 
But Mosiev had become known for his bridges designed based on deflection theory, which stated that longer suspension bridges could be built with less steel because their weight didn't require trusses built beneath the road to withstand wind and traffic. That approach, which required two towers for the bridge work to stretch between rather than what you've seen in bridges that are older that have physical supports from below all along the length of the bridgeway, had been very successful on many bridges already, long before Mosiev was given the Tacoma Narrows job, and he used that same design approach again. Construction started in November of 1938, And while the bridge was being built, workers had noticed that there was a lot of movement, just a rippling movement, even in a light wind. Toward the end of construction, that movement had become so common and intense enough that workers were said to have chewed on lemons to stave off motion sickness. This sounds miserable to me as a person (laughs) prone to motion sickness. (laughs) Uh, The thinking had been that once the bridge's concrete lanes were poured so traffic could cross the bridge, that rippling would diminish, but it really did not. There were various efforts made to try to get this vibration to stop or even just be reduced. None of them really had a significant result. Of course, this was concerning. So a study was commissioned by the Washington Toll Bridge Authority to examine the issue. And that study was headed up by a professor of civil engineering from the University of Washington. That was F. Bert Farquharson. And he made a detailed scale model of the bridge, and he put it through various conditions in a wind tunnel to see how it behaved. He gave a preliminary report, but even though it included some suggestions about how to manage this movement problem... Farquharson also included his opinion that really there needed to be more study of this movement. But having the report on file with suggestions was all the bridge project engineers felt that they needed to give assurances to the public that this bridge was safe. On July 1st of 1940, the bridge opened. A local newspaper, the Spokesman Review of Spokane, Washington, ran the headline, quote, share $6,400,000 bridge opening East Side citizens will attend dedication of Tacoma structure today. The opening ceremony was attended by the governor, Clarence D. Martin, as well as highway officials and heads of the three counties who had stakes in this project. Colonel E.W. Clark, the acting commissioner of public works, gave a speech at this ceremony, and he touted the bridge's beauty and noted how it was going to expand commerce. Like Clark, the press coverage spoke about what a boon the bridge would be for tourism, stating, quote, the bridge will bring closer to the population centers of Puget Sound and the heavily traveled lanes of tourists, the Olympic Peninsula. It will form a connecting link between Mount Rainier National Park and the Olympic National Park. The press coverage also noted the bridge's significance for military connectivity, writing, quote, in addition to providing access to the tourist attractions of the peninsula, The bridge connects the two great military and naval centers of the state, Fort Lewis and McCord Field at Tacoma, and the Puget Sound Navy Yard at Bremerton. The bridge opening was tied to McCord not only because it created a physical connection to it. The bridge and the airfield were actually sharing a birthday week. The airfield had been in operation for 10 years at that point, but had been a municipal airport before becoming part of the military's war preparation. And it was renamed for Army Air Corps Colonel William McCord the same week that the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was opened. Another floating bridge across Lake Washington was also opened that same week. There were five days of events and ceremonies as the area celebrated all of these new openings. And there was a water carnival in honor of the bridges leading up to a huge 4th of July party, which concluded the holiday and the celebrations of the new bridges and renamed airfield with a spectacular fireworks show. The papers also ran statistics on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It was the third largest suspension bridge in the world. The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and the George Washington Bridge that spans the Hudson River between Manhattan and Fort Lee, New Jersey, were the two bigger ones. On the Tacoma side of the bridge, there was a toll center and an observation plaza where tourists could stop and take in the view. Per the Spokesman Review, quote, Each of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge towers stands 425 feet above the water. The cables carried by these towers were spun from 6,308 wires anchored at each end to huge blocks of concrete weighing approximately 
52,500 tons. The two main cables have a total weight of approximately 3,817 tons, and the total suspended weight which they sustain is in excess of 11,250 tons. At the final tally, the Public Works Administration grant had provided $2,880,000 for the project, and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation loaned the state of Washington another $3,520,000. This bridge allegedly had the nickname Galloping Gertie from the very start because of its tendency to undulate. Construction workers are said to have started calling it that as it was being built. It also got another nickname among motorists, which was the roller coaster. It was not unusual to be driving across the bridge and just see the car in front of you dip out of view, which in the daytime was unsettling, and at night, it meant it just sometimes looked like their lights suddenly blinked off. That kind of sounds more unsettling. There were even some drivers who sought out that unsettling thrill. They would try to time their crossing of the bridge to the best wind conditions so they could really get that roller coaster effect. Yeah, there were also pedestrians that did this, that were like, I'm going to walk across that bridge when it's all crazy. I don't think that sounds fun, but everybody has their own desires. On November 7th, 1940, just four months and six days after the bridge opened, it famously collapsed. That day, the wind blowing from the west to east reached an estimated 42 miles per hour. That's about 67.6 kilometers. And while it was common for the bridge to buck up and down in the wind, the motion that the westerly wind stirred up seemed a little bit different that day. The sides of the bridge were rippling, but not in phase with one another. So the bridge started this twisting side-to-side motion as well as up and down. This was a motion that was not normal for it at all. So one of the reasons we can say that it famously collapsed is that there is footage of it, quite a lot of footage of it. The most famous footage was shot by Barney Elliott and Harbin Monroe. They owned a Tacoma business called The Camera Shop, and both of them always kept their cameras loaded According to the account of Monroe's widow decades later, quote, when they got the call, the bridge was really jumping. They jumped in their cars and prayed they got something, that's something being pictures, and they did. Their film made it into newsreels that were shown in theaters all over the U.S. and around the world. And that footage was awarded Outstanding Domestic Newsreel of the Year by the National Headliners Club. Copies were requested by engineers around the world so they could study what happened. But it is very likely that most people have seen this footage at the wrong speed, according to a paper that was released in 2015 by Texas State University physics and astronomy professor Don Olson and collaborators Joseph Hook and Russell Dosher. When reviewing the footage, which had been converted from film to video a very long time ago, the researchers noted that the bridge was shown having 18 twisting cycles per minute. But this did not match up with the recorded information that had been noted by engineers the day of the collapse. That data listed the most rapid pacing of the twisting at 12 cycles per minute. Elliot and Monroe's footage had been shot at 16 frames per second, but when it was converted to video, it had been presumed to have been shot at 24 frames per second. So the movement has long appeared to have been even more frantic than it actually was. We still don't want to play this down. It was plenty frantic in reality. Yeah, I feel like even at the slightly slower pace, that would almost be more alarming because you could really see you could see the movement of it and how dramatic it was a little bit clearer. Yeah, it's funny. I read one while I was I was researching this particular part of it. One uh, quote, I don't remember if it was from the main researcher or not, that was like, no, slow down. It's really quite beautiful and elegant. And I was like, for real? <laughs> <laughs> beautiful and elegant and, uh, and terrifying. Uh-huh. Regardless of the speed, though, The various footage taken means that you can easily see this twisting motion, which at points had the roadway tilted at a 45-degree angle. The last pedestrian on the bridge, who had been one of those thrill-seekers who had wanted to cross it on a windy day, reported seeing straight down into the water below at one point because of the pitch of the bridge. He was able to crawl to safety. I'm not sure if he is specifically the person in the picture I found for this episode, but I did find a picture of a person trying to get off that bridge. I think that is the journalist that we'll talk about in a bit. Okay. Um, 
this was a person that got off the bridge well before the collapse, Mm -hmm. but was just like, as it was starting, was like, whoa, I can look right down to my right, and it's like looking into the water. Um, That collapse, though, was not instant. The bridge had been closed to traffic as soon as officials realized just how extreme and unsafe the situation was. And from the beginning of the failure conditions to the actual collapse, that took between 45 and 60 minutes. So there was enough time for several different people to get their cameras out and get footage of the whole thing, finally reaching its crescendo of movement and collapsing. At 11 a.m., a large section of the bridge fell. This included concrete and steel girders that had been part of the center deck. And the rest of the center span fell right after it. The main cables went slack and the towers leaned away from each other and toward the side of the river. The bridge at that point was just gone. On a bit of a sad note, there was only one fatality that day. It was not a person, but a dog. That dog, named Tubby, was the pet of a man named Leonard Coatsworth. And Coatsworth was a reporter working for the Tacoma News Tribune at the time. And he had to leave the car on the bridge and crawl to a safe spot. He later described this ordeal. Quote, Just as I drove past the towers, the bridge began to sway violently from side to side. Before I realized it, the tilt became so violent that I lost control of the car. I jammed on the brakes and got out, only to be thrown onto my face against the curb. Around me, I could hear concrete cracking. I started to get my dog Tubby, but was thrown again before I could reach the car. The car itself began to slide from side to side of the roadway. On hands and knees most of the time, I crawled 500 yards or more to the towers. My breath was coming in gasps. My knees were raw and bleeding. My hands bruised and swollen from gripping the concrete curb. Toward the last, I risked rising to my feet and running a few yards at a time. Safely back at the toll plaza, I saw the bridge in its final collapse and saw my car plunge into the narrows. Incidentally... Farquharson had attempted to rescue this dog when the bridge's motion eased for a brief period, but the dog, obviously frightened, bit him. He wasn't able to get it from the car before needing to get back off of the bridge himself. Yeah, Farquharson is another person who took footage that day. Uh, You can actually, there's footage of him walking back from trying to save the dog, and you can see him kind of cradling his arm that has been bitten. Um, We are going to take a quick sponsor break, and when we come back, we will talk about what happened after the bridge collapsed. Papers around the world ran the story of the bridge for days, under headlines like, Galloping Gertie Lies Down in River. One of the biggest issues immediately following the bridge disaster was, of course, placing blame somewhere. Who or what entity had dropped the ball and, as a consequence, endangered the public in the process? There was a lot of finger-pointing. Congressman John Coffey, who was born and raised in Tacoma, made public statements that corners had been cut to meet budget limitations. The bridge engineering firm that the federal government had assigned to the project, including Leon Mosiev himself, was initially blamed for the failure by the project's engineer, Clark Eldridge. But he walked those statements back almost immediately, claiming that he had been misunderstood by the press. Eldridge had been frustrated about the bridge budget from the very beginning. He had estimated the needed budget at $11 million. That was almost twice what was eventually obtained. It seemed really natural to him to blame Mosieff's cost-cutting design. And as for Mosieff, he told the press, quote, I'm completely at a loss to explain the collapse. Yeah, do keep in mind, he had built a lot of bridges before this time on this same set of principles, and there had not been problems. There were 23 different insurance companies involved in trying to sort this whole situation out. While at the same time, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the Federal Public Works Administration, and the Washington Toll Bridge Authority were feverishly trying to ensure that no government entity was made a scapegoat. To that end, multiple investigative commissions were established by those various entities and insurance companies to analyze all of the information available and to try to identify the critical failure that had caused the bridge to collapse. Bert Farquharson also continued his own examination of the bridge using his lab and wind tunnel setup. The various commissions and investigations initially all had similar assessments. The materials were ruled out as a problem. That put down rumors that inferior material had been used to cut costs. 
Similarly, the workmanship was deemed to be sound. That meant that the problem was somewhere in the design. But most assessments were that the project had been designed in accordance with current standards. Naturally, Leon Mosieff's firm began a very careful watch of some of their other projects, including their other famous suspension bridge on the West Coast, the Golden Gate Bridge. There were, of course, fears that it too could have issues that could result in a similar catastrophe, but it never evidenced any of these problems or instabilities that had ultimately led to the collapse of Gertie. Yeah, I think if it, at that point, if I had been, uh, if I had been Leon Mosieff, or if I had been anybody that needed to drive back and forth across the Golden Gate Bridge, I probably would have been terrified for just uh, <laughs> an indefinite amount of time after this. Yeah. Investigations continued. The road deck was scrutinized as part of it, and one problem identified there was that it was too light and flexible to handle windy conditions, although it was definitely strong enough to handle the loads of vehicular traffic that it had been designed for. But it was an aerodynamicist from Pasadena who really started introducing some theories into these investigations that would ultimately change how bridges are designed. Theodore von Karman of the California Institute of Technology put forth the idea that focusing on the flexibility of the roadway was really not getting at the cause of the bridge's disastrous end. The real problem in his estimation was the way that the structure of the roadway met the wind. This wasn't something that all of the other researchers embraced initially. Aerodynamics had not, at this point, really been a part of projects like this. The calculations that were made in design were all about strength, calculated using static forces. So while wind was considered, for example, it was just about how strong a gust could be at a given speed, and it didn't really include analysis of how that wind might move around a structure. Incidentally, Von Karman weighed in on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse because the initial investigations had chalked up the disaster basically to being a freak accident. There was no fault found with the bridge design, so papers reported that the plan was to rebuild the structure according to the same design. When Von Karman read this, he worried that the exact same thing would just happen again. Yeah, he was like, I, I have information. I have ideas you should hear. <laughs> uh, there are a few different factors that contributed to this bridge collapse. This is something that has evolved over time, so we'll talk about this a bit. One was the width of the roadway on the structure. So it was a two-lane bridge. If it had been wider, it would have been heavier and less likely to twist and buck in the wind like it did. The decision to make it a two-lane structure was driven by two major factors. One, at the time, they weren't really anticipating that it was going to be a heavily trafficked roadway. Keep in mind, this was thought of as, like, a connector for tourists and a connector for military things, not really, like, part of the infrastructure that would be used every day by a bunch of citizens. And for another thing, they were trying to maximize their spend. So they were like, we can get the whole roadway, but it should be narrower rather than wider. But what has come to be known as a Carmen Vortex Street, or sometimes just vortex shedding, has long been considered the big contributor in what happened. Very basically, when wind meets an object, it forms eddies as it's cleaved by that object. And those eddies then exert their own vibrational force. This means that alternating zones of high and low pressure above and below the bridge deck were causing it to move up and down in a way that made the road twist side to side while simultaneously rising and falling the way it always had. Yes, as we talk about all of this, keep in mind, like I said, the, uh, our knowledge of this is evolving. So this is what was believed to be entirely it at the time. Uh, because the bridge had been built with solid plates on the side rather than open trusses that would have allowed the wind to pass through, the wind was hitting those plates forming those vortices and then interacting with the bridge at the same time it was experiencing its usual undulation. So in addition to suggesting that open trusses be used on the sides of the new structure, Von Karman also recommended that there be grates in between lanes of the roadway that would allow air to pass through that angle of the structure as well. Most testing models supported Von Karman's assertions, even though there was still some resistance within the engineering community about his thoughts on bridge design. He was brought into the rebuild project as an advisor by the Washington Toll Bridge Authority. For a long time, really decades, the failure of the bridge had been chalked up to resonance. 
meaning a scenario when a force vibrating at the same natural frequency of a second object forces that second object into an amplified vibrational motion that can destroy things. But that explanation oversimplified what was happening with the bridge the day that it collapsed. I feel like I had this as an example in like a physics class. You absolutely did. You absolutely did. Because it really wasn't until fairly recently, the last decade, that this idea changed a little bit. Like, that's a completely sound explanation. You know, as the bridge was dropping on one side, there were high and low pressures forming above and below it that countered each other and would cause it to twist the other way. But today, that idea of vortex shedding as the cause has been refined to reflect that after the bridge twisted one way due to vortex shedding, its momentum as it returned back to its flat position meant that it was actually carrying it past that flat state and into the other direction, allowing wind to catch it again and increase the ongoing twisting in what's called aeroelastic flutter. The big difference here is that the mechanism isn't the vortex shedding applying force to the objects. The movement of the object itself is contributing to the flutter. That's basically saying it essentially rocked itself apart. One of the um, the kind of like easy day-to-day world examples that people give when they're trying to explain this is like if you're holding a blade of grass or a piece of paper and you blow on the edge of it, you'll see it like flutter. And it's kind of the same thing, but just at a massive scale. This catastrophe and all of this study also led to the development of the field of bridge aerodynamics aeroelastics. There was, perhaps surprisingly, only one person who had legal ramifications after the bridge collapsed. It had nothing to do with its design or construction, though. It had to do with insurance. On December 4th, 1940, the following article appeared in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle titled, Galloping Gertie Insurer Bailed Out. Quote, insurance agent Hallett French, 44, who wrote an $800,000 policy on Galloping Gertie, was free on $2,000 bail today on a charge of grand larceny. His company, the Merchants Fire Insurance Company of New York, charged that he had failed to remit $70,000 in premiums, including an $8,000 premium on the policy he issued against Galloping Gertie collapsing. The company said it was unaware that it had issued a policy on the bridge. French was the company's general agent and was authorized to issue policies without prior authorization. The policy is binding, but company officials did not expect their loss to total more than $200,000 because much of the bridge can be salvaged and the total loss will be prorated among 22 companies which had issued policies on it. Yeah, so just in case it's not clear... He had written a policy, had collected the premiums, and had pocketed those premiums. (laughs) He was not actually then turning that over to his company. They didn't know he had written this policy and was collecting money on it. So they weren't catching it on the books because there was no record of it. (laughs) Um, But because of his high position in the company, he had issued a a valid policy. So... uh, That's even more ridiculous than I really understood from having just read that (laughs) paragraph. I mean, that's like, that's a a brazen con right there. Um, He took a gamble on this one and lost very badly. Don't be like Hallett French, kids. Um, That last line, though, that Tracy read about the bridge's salvageability turned out to be untrue. Uh, engineers working for the Washington Toll Bridge Authority determined that the bridge could not be salvaged and deemed it a total loss. This assessment was supported by additional independent studies. The back and forth over this, over whether they could actually reuse some of the, the bridge material, led to a trial being scheduled in 1941 to rule on the dispute between the WTBA and the insurance companies, but that case was settled out of court before the trial began. In that settlement, the state of Washington was given salvage rights and $4 million. In 1992, the parts of the original bridge, which had not been pulled up from where they fell into the water in 1940, were added to the National Register of Historic Places, in part to protect them from salvagers trying to go and pick up these relics from the ocean. As for Hallett R. French, he returned a chunk of the money he had pocketed and begged for mercy with Judge Malcolm Douglas He was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but got out on good behavior after serving just two. Yeah, he remained, I believe, in Washington Washington for the rest of his life. I think he died, I'm pulling this from memory, not from immediate notes, uh, in the late 1960s. 
Leon Mosieff continued to study what had happened in Washington and used his ongoing examination of the failure to improve the field of bridge design. His reputation had definitely suffered, but he also seemed to really have wanted to try to make some good come out of the fall of Galloping Gertie and to advance his field through the knowledge that could be gained from this. He had less than three years to work on that, though. He died of a heart attack at his summer home in New Jersey in 1943 at the age of 70. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was rebuilt, and the new bridge, dubbed Sturdy Gertie, was opened in 1950. This bridge, which was designed to incorporate the learnings from the 1940 bridge collapse, remains in use today. On July 15th of 2007, another Tacoma Narrows bridge was built parallel and just south of the 1950 structure to accommodate more traffic volume. So the 1950 bridge carries westbound traffic and the 2007 bridge handles the eastbound flow. When the 2007 bridge opened, the first car to cross it after the runners of a charity 5K was a 1923 Lincoln Touring car which was the exact same car that had been the first one to cross Galloping Gertie back in 1940. And now for an element of the story that is almost worthy of an October Halloween season episode. Uh, It has long been rumored that a mammoth version of the giant Pacific octopus species lives in the wreckage of Galloping Gertie that remains on the floor of the Narrows underneath those modern bridges. Uh, King Octopus, as he is often called, is practically a local celebrity. There are... GPOs, uh, giant Pacific octopuses that live in the area, but the sad fact is they are not a long-lived species. They only live about three to five years at most. So the idea that there has been one that is there for decades is very fun. It's not really founded in reality, though. (laughs) There are some sad aspects to that whole octopus thing that we'll talk about in our behind the scenes. Yeah. I'm glad you picked this one. It was one of those things where I was like, I'm surprised somehow neither we or any of the previous hosts have taken this on. Well, I think it's one of those things that people think everybody knows about, right? Yeah. Because we have all seen that footage, but, like, all of the crazy insurance and financing and, like, weird stuff, that doesn't really ever hit the public knowledge in the same way it's, like... Dis- I see a lot of discussions about, like, what caused this bridge to collapse and what have we learned from it and, like, mm-hmm. physics discussions... But when you get into the actual mechanisms of, you know, bureaucracy and red tape that are involved, it becomes a whole other story with its own sub-dramas that play out. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I mostly remembered it as, like, physics problem, Mm -hmm. dramatic footage, and what I have now confirmed as we took a moment to leave room for an ad break, a pioneer car audio commercial. Um, I don't know exactly when, but yeah. Yeah, somehow I missed that one. Even though I think I probably have always watched more TV than you. <laughs> <laughs> I It seems like this would have been when I was in maybe high school or possibly college age, but I could just be making that up. I have I did not confirm when that commercial was actually airing. Uh, do you have do you have listener mail? I do. I actually have two pieces of listener mail. Uh, The first is from our listener, David, who writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I'm a longtime listener and huge fan. I always enjoy recommending an episode to friends who mention an event or a person you've covered in depth. I also suspect my teenage kids have picked up a cool anecdote or perspective by osmosis more than once, so thank you for that. When I was listening to the Grand Central episode, you mentioned the extensive cleaning the building received a few decades back. One of my favorite little details to point out to visitors is the tiny little spot on the ceiling that the crew left filthy on purpose. You can still see a tiny rectangle of layered-on soot and smoke and grime if you know where to look. Stand between the famous clock and the west stairway facing the steps. Look up and to the right along the vaulted edge, close to the painted image of the constellation Cancer, and you will see a small area that was left blackened to give you a sense of just how bad it was. I was there for the first time in about 15 months last weekend and took a photo. Uh, And he sent this photo, and it is, it's a very tiny, it looks almost like someone put a sticker on the wall uh, because it looks so completely different and weird. But in fact, that is historical dirt, (laughs) which I absolutely love knowing that it's there. Um, So thank you for that. I'm going to absolutely be looking for that the next time that I am there. So thank you for that, David, because I'm 100% looking. Our second email is from our listener, Aaron. This email delights me utterly. 
uh, Aaron writes, Hi, Tracy and Holly. Just wanted to let you know that Lou Garou, the beloved Rou Garou at the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans, is now vaccinated. He has been social distancing and wearing his mask all year, but is ready to start meeting in small groups soon. As you can see on his vaccination card... Uh, there's a photo attached. He received the, I believe this is pronounced Zotus vaccine, which is used for the great apes. He enjoys dressing up for holidays throughout the year, as can easily be seen through a quick Google search. Hopefully, he'll be ready to go for the next Rougarou Festival so you can visit soon. I enjoy the podcast, and your New Orleans live show was great. Thanks for all that you do, Aaron. Um, I did not know that there was a Rougarou at the Audubon Zoo, and now there's another place I have to go. This is adorable. <laughs> it's basically a cute figure that they have set up a rougarou standing there uh in his his majesty uh wearing a mask <laughs> so for anybody it's not an actual animal it's a a, a display it's adorable though i want to go so bad now and i love that he's got a little vaccine card um that means we can hug him i hope um so aaron thank you so much because that is an absolute delight and a thing i didn't know about now i know and look out Look out, Zoo, I'm coming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you would like to write us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And if you, for some reason, have not yet subscribed and you're thinking you want to, that's easy as pie. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.